This is incredible. Look around you. This is a unique group. You're here because you believe in the power of genomics to tackle the world's biggest challenges. It's not an accident that you're here. But who's sitting a few seats over from you? Well, that might be a surprise. Your ministers of health, your policymakers and pairs influencing access and adoption, your philanthropists who invest in cutting edge research, your doctors at the front lines of patient care, your Nobel laureates and future Nobel laureates. Oh, and Bill Gates and President Obama will be here too. <laughs> this is the genome era. And this is our time. Now, many of you have worked in this field for decades. And sometimes it feels like the future we envision is still far off. My hope is that by the end of this conference, you'll feel it's much closer than you think. Here's what the future looks like. Fitz Ketzler's parents had barely made it home from the hospital with him when the phone rang. It was his doctor telling them to turn around and come straight back to the hospital. Now, as a parent, imagine receiving that call. Turns out, Fitz had severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID. It meant that he was incredibly vulnerable to any pathogen. Even something as minor as a cold could be life-threatening. Life expectancy for these children is about a year, if they're lucky. Now, typically, a bone marrow transplant is the primary course of treatment. But Fitz had one of the most severe forms of SCID, so a transplant wouldn't be enough for him. Fitz was lucky. Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine right here in San Diego was able to do rapid whole genome sequencing. They identified a specific kind of SCID and a gene therapy trial that was available at UCSF. They gave Fitz a lentiviral gene transfer which inserts a normal copy of the gene DCLRE1C into his bone marrow. This meant that Fitz could begin to make his own B and T cells normally. And within the first year, that's exactly what happened. Fitz was only the seventh baby in UCSF's clinical trial, patient 007. I predict he's going to like fast cars when he grows up. <laughs> this year, Fitz celebrated his third birthday by throwing out the first pitch at the Padres game. Here he is with Alex, our CTO. Now, I get emotional when I think about the possibilities ahead for Fitz. Who will he become? What will he create? As I said before, Fitz was lucky. Within 92 hours of taking his first breath, he had gotten both a definitive diagnosis and a solid care plan. The reality today is that the average rare disease patient waits five to seven years for a diagnosis, if they receive one at all. Every month delayed in cancer treatment can raise a patient's risk of death by 10%. Gene therapies and clinical trials aren't generally accessible. Medical costs bankrupt families, even when they're insured. We are here today to change that. People in this room made Fitz's treatment a reality. It's the people in this room who must make this the norm and not the exception. That's why, over the next four days, we're giving you access to the tools, insights, and connections to revolutionize your work in the world. The last few years have been challenging. But they've also shown the world the promise of genomics and the power of collaboration. mRNA research has been going on since the 70s. But in the last two and a half years, we've gone from no mRNA vaccines to 2.6 billion people vaccinated. This would not have been possible without Moderna and Pfizer. And I know we have some people from both those companies in the room, so, so thank you. mRNA technology can also be used to fight HIV, malaria, Ebola, and even cancer. Beyond vaccines, genomic medicine development is accelerating as well. Genomic-based therapies already are 15% of the emerging drug pipeline. 
As the pandemic unfolded, for the first time, the whole world focused on a single problem. The global community dramatically expanded a genomic surveillance infrastructure. Just a few years ago, many underdeveloped countries had no sequencing capabilities at all. Illumina partnered with dozens of labs and researchers across Africa, including Tulio Dolavera and Christian Happy, I know you're both here, uh, and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create the Africa Pathogen Genomics Initiative. Today, 205 countries use genomic sequencing as part of their surveillance tools for SARS-CoV-2. For the first time, genomic medicine was delivered at scale to meet a global need. It's now being brought to bear against one of the biggest existential threats we've ever faced. The climate crisis affects everything and everyone, from rising costs to international conflict and food insecurity. Today, more than 800 million people are undernourished. 45 countries are teetering on the edge of famine. Climate change is decimating sustenance crops around the world. Now, one of the most important turns out to be yams. Yams feed over 300 million people worldwide. Pioneering genomics researchers like Dr. Ranjana Bhattacharjee are working to protect the resilience. Dr. Bhattacharjee sequenced 1,000 yam samples, and her work will help millions of farmers produce heat and disease resistant varieties. Similar innovations already happening for livestock and sustenance crops like wheat and oats. These technologies have the potential to end food insecurity for hundreds of millions more people worldwide. But this is just one person sequencing 1,000 yams. We need thousands more like her. OK, let's talk about gene editing. These therapies are turbocharging treatments for an expanding number of diseases. Victoria Gray became one of the first, first people in history to be cured of sickle cell anemia with CRISPR gene editing therapy. Now 300,000 babies are born each year with sickle cell. Victoria's cure is just the beginning. This needs to be the norm for every single baby born with sickle cell. And even beyond CRISPR, Genomic testing and therapies are becoming foundational in clinical care. The FDA approved 97 biomarker-related drugs in 2021 alone. Genomics is also transforming every step of cancer care, from early detection to recurrence monitoring. Grail Gallery is the first multi-cancer early screening test on the market. Gallery looks for more than 50 types of cancer. 45 of them have no other screens. So far, it's been adopted by 34 health systems, large employers and insurers, and over 1,500 healthcare providers. Jim Ford was 50 years old and healthy. He was comfortably retired, working two days a week at his local golf club. His doctor invited him to get into a gallery trial, and then the results came back in, and boom, pancreatic cancer stage two. Jim saw the news as a death sentence. But the way his oncologist tells it, it was like hitting the lottery. Because there are no real symptoms at stage two. You don't see patients at stage two. You typically find pancreatic cancer at stage four. And then you've got about a year to live. But Jim said yes to a clinical trial. He got treated early. And today, he's cancer free. There are millions of people like Jim who have cancer lurking inside them and have no idea. A simple little blood test like Gallery genuinely can be the difference between life and death. And miracles like these are not enough. There are gaps we need to fill. Many people outside our community don't even know that genomic testing is available. We need more research on how to get these tests implemented broadly especially in underserved communities. For example, nearly 20,000 patients will receive a new diagnosis of ovarian cancer this year. Only about a quarter of them will receive HRD testing. That number should be 100%. Only one in three of biomarker-eligible cancer patients actually receive any testing at all. 
And even those tests, only 58% of them are reimbursed, often on a case-by-case -case basis. That should be 100%. When I look at those statistics, I think back to a dear friend of mine, Lee. She died at age 31 of ovarian cancer. It was very aggressive. The time between her diagnosis and her passing was less than a year. Her treatment was painful. No, it was excruciating. And ultimately, ineffective. In her case, the cure was as bad as the disease. And I remember how much she suffered. She passed away right before I got the call from Illumina. Lee set me on the course to say, yes, there's something important I need to work on here. Even those lucky few with access to testing today may not get a targeted therapy. More than half the patients who are tested do not have an actual biomarker, so no targeted therapies exist for them. Genomics has also accelerated our understanding of disease risk. As we look forward, though, we need multiomics to help us truly understand the biology of disease, like brain disease, the third largest healthcare problem in developed countries. That includes both neurodegenerative diseases and mental disorders. We're seeing new treatment possibilities for Alzheimer's on the horizon, like Biogen's exciting trial results from yesterday. But for now, even to know if you have Alzheimer's, we have to rely on cognitive tests and brain scans. Today, to truly answer the question, do I have Alzheimer's, your genome alone isn't enough. Early diagnosis and treatment depend on our ability to conduct proteomic research at scale. Over 90% of drug targets and biomarkers are proteins. That makes richer proteomic analysis a priority for biopharma. Genomic data should also represent the diversity of our global populations. Today, it's glaringly, unfairly imbalanced. Genomic data is the blueprint for everything, from identifying new diseases to precision drug development. That means the data must be equitable. As just one example, only 2% of genomic data is from African individuals or individuals with African ancestry. But 17% of the world's population is African. I mean, 87% of individuals included in genomic studies of disease risk are of European ancestry. Genomics shouldn't be just another tool for the rich or the lucky. The challenges we face may seem insurmountable, but I'm optimistic. I don't think anyone in this room would be here if you weren't as well. There's a line from the poet Robert Browning that I love, which says in part, our reach should exceed our grasp. We need to recast our ambition about what's possible in an omics-powered world. I have big goals for all of us in the genomic community to collaborate on and make a reality. Tomorrow, we're announcing a suite of the most insanely powerful genomics tools ever created. And it gives me even more confidence in what I'm about to say. We can give everyone access to their personal genome. In 10 years, your genome should be the foundational element of your health record, not your blood pressure or your temperature on a certain day or even your family history. It'll be what tells you, what am I at risk of? How often should I screen? What drugs will cure me? What drugs will kill me? Then, when everyone has access to their personal genome, we make omics foundational to lifetime health management. We can carry out more than 20 genomic tests like Gallery over the course of someone's life. Newborns like Fitz with suspected genetic conditions will have access to rapid whole genome sequencing as a frontline diagnostic just like Dr. Stephen Kingsmore has instituted at Rady Children's. Personalized omics screening for disease and overall health will be routine. Omic testing will support early and accurate diagnoses. Therapy selection and effectiveness monitoring will be required at every progressive treatment line. 
pharmacogenomic testing will select the right treatment at the right level. Most importantly, will enable our own immune systems to be the strongest therapeutic available. We can shift cancer detection from stage four to stage one. Each year, more than 19 million people worldwide are diagnosed with some form of cancer. Nearly 10 million will die from it. 70% of cancer patients are diagnosed with advanced disease. One third of them will be dead within five years. I believe we can cut this in half in 10 years time. We'll do this through early detection and targeted therapies. Over the next decade, Grail Gallery's test will target 75 million people. Gallery is already becoming a routine part of healthcare screenings in, in some health systems. We can increase their efficacy by 10 times, transforming cancer survivability. Today, when a patient completes chemo, that milestone is celebrated by ringing a bell. There are differing interpretations of that ritual because it doesn't actually mean that you're done. What it means is that you survived one of the many aggressive treatment paths, and it doesn't mean you're cancer-free. Tom Wiebert, a colon cancer survivor who spoke at one of our company meetings recently, expressed a sentiment that stopped me in my tracks. What if you don't need that bell anymore? We see the impact genomics will have on cancer. We can have a similar impact on the other major causes of death. Look, we know one out of 200 patients have a type of underlying cardiovascular disease that's either missed or goes untreated. No wonder it's the top cause of death around the world. Verve Therapeutics has begun human trials of the first CRISPR base editor for cardiovascular disease. It has the potential to permanently lower LDL cholesterol with a single treatment. More drugs will be approved faster. Treatments will be more effective for more than the select few. Right now, we probably have more questions about neurological and neurodegenerative diseases than any other category. We can see that schizophrenia runs in families, but we can't tell why. We don't know what causes autism. And that's a huge source of distress for parents who think they did something wrong. And then there's Alzheimer's. In the audience today, we have some team members from Somalogic. Partnering with the National Institute of Aging, they've identified new drug targets based on proteomic signatures in Alzheimer's patients. This will massively accelerate the development of diagnostic and therapeutic tools, as well as precise lifetime monitoring. Because of multiomics, we'll be able to say, we understand the biological drivers of Alzheimer's disease, and here's what we can do about it. And absolutely, we must use genomics on a scale big enough to address our resource needs anywhere on Earth. We can use genomics to understand which seeds will be the most productive, which will be the most resilient to drought and disease. And even I was surprised to learn, genomics can have a direct impact on reducing emissions. A single study demonstrated a 5% uh, projected reduction in methane emissions using genomic-guided selection in cattle. CRISPR gene editing technology is already being used to bolster the natural ability of plants and soil microbes to both capture and store atmospheric carbon. Carbon dioxide removal will play an increasingly important role in reducing the global impact from climate change and potentially reversing its course. Genomics can make this all happen. And as almost everyone in this room knows better than most, we can prevent the next pathogenic outbreak from becoming another global pandemic. If we had stopped the COVID pandemic in the first 100 days, we could have saved over 98% of the lives lost so far. We have it within our grasp. The question is, will we? There will always be new emerging pathogens. We'll be able to come out with vaccines and therapies earlier, but what matters is our ability to identify and control their spread. Effective global surveillance backed by collaboration and adoption can create a world that never sees another pandemic. Look, we're up against the biggest challenges humanity has ever faced. And in this room, we have some of the world's most brilliant minds. 
We know what we need to do to make these solutions a reality in the next decade. So here's the deal. If people like us in this room don't do it, it doesn't happen. I challenge all of us to be bold in our thinking, to push ourselves to be even more ambitious about what's possible. Ask yourself right now, what would it take to make my patient's genome the cornerstone of their healthcare? What would it take to bring equity and access into everything I do? Then ask yourself right now, what do I need from the people in this room? What can I offer? For everyone here, there was a moment when you realized genomics is a key to help me make a difference in this world. A moment when it became clear that you would be a researcher, a doctor, clinical scientist. You did the work, you got the PhD, you persevered to that residency, you made the commitment to something you believed in. You saw the possibilities of what you could achieve if you said yes. You got a glimpse of the world that you could help create. Sitting here today, we know why we invited you. Your credentials speak for themselves. But I want you to think about the reason why you are here. Think back to that moment when you chose this path. That's the path that led you here. There's no other room quite like this in the whole world. Over the next four days, you're in a very special community. Make it count. Make connections. Bring them home with you. When we come back next year, we should be able to tell each other how we move the world forward. I'm betting on you, and I'm betting on us for all you've done and that you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you.